me apologize, uh, Professor Black. Uh, we thought we'd be able to get your testimony uh, finished, but the point is that we ran out of time. You know, you have to vote around here, and if you don't vote, you know, your constituents will talk about it. You know, we talk about anger. You know, that's the uh, same kind of anger we get with this compensation uh, if you don't vote. So uh, we had to run over to uh, make the vote. So if you would continue, please. Okay. Turn your mic on. <laughs> All right. Uh, to resume, the critical thing to understand about accounting control fraud in connection with executive compensation is that it is a sure thing. It's a very simple formula for how you optimize. You grow really rapidly. You make very, very bad loans you have extreme leverage, and you put minimal loss reserves. If you do those four things, you will produce not just profits, but record profits. And then you can use seemingly normal corporate mechanisms of compensation to convert firm assets to your benefit as the CEO. It is the perfect crime. If you do it without giving orders, to engage in the accounting fraud. And you can give that order through modern executive compensation. I can't send a memo at Fannie Mae that says to 10,000 employees, we want to commit accounting fraud. But I can do the same thing with my compensation system. All I have to do is extend it, not just to the top 100. These modern compensation systems go f much farther down in the organization. And you will get, as a relatively junior officer, an incredible increase in your income. And as a more senior officer, of course, even more. And all you have to do is fudge the numbers. And then all I have to do as the CEO is not care and pay you a maximum bonus based on those fudged numbers. And the degree of this fudging is extraordinary. IndyMac losses on Alt-A, liar's loans, are running roughly 80%, it appears. OTS, the Office of Thrift Supervision, reports overall Alt-A loans are causing losses of 55%. Those are staggering numbers. The FBI has publicly testified that it would be irresponsible to discuss the current crisis without discussing the role of fraud in it. So no, compensation isn't what directly causes the largest losses. Compensation incents you to make deliberately bad loans to grow very rapidly to produce financial bubbles. That produces catastrophic losses. And that is the system that we have right now. I don't know where I am in terms of time, really. I think I've probably done five minutes, and I'll stop. You no, know, the day is not young. Thank you very much. Let me thank both of you for your, your, your testimony. And again, I apologize for the, uh, the break of the inter interruption that we had. Um, but uh, let me begin with you, um, uh, uh, Prof Professor Black. Uh, please explain the relationship between what you term accounting control fraud, uh, of course, and excessive executive compensation. This exists in both the criminology literature and the economics literature, and indeed we work together on it. Uh, the most famous piece is by the Nobel Prize winner George Akerlof and Paul Romer, uh, then at Berkeley, now at Stanford. And they have an article in 1993 entitled Looting, Bankruptcy for Profit. And this is how it works. I gave you the optimization condition. You grow really rapidly. You make deliberately very bad loans you have extreme leverage, and you don't put on loss reserves. If you do those things, it must 
be the case that you will report record earnings. That was true in the savings and loan crisis, where Lincoln Savings and Vernon's, the two worst control frauds <coughs> in America, reported at different time periods, obviously, that they were the most profitable savings and loans in America. By the way, as a footnote, this also screws up any econometric analysis. It produces per uh, perverse results. All right, so now we have record income. Directly, of course, under modern executive compensation, which is extremely large and heavily oriented towards short-term accounting gains, this produces maximum bonuses. Frank Raines, in the context of Fannie Mae, when he was still running it, was asked by Business Week, why do we have all these frauds, referring to the Enron and WorldCom frauds, and he said it's because of modern executive compensation that when you put enough money in front of people, good people will do bad things. The exact quotation is in my testimony, but that last line is, I think, word for word. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very, very much, um, Professor Black. Um, Professor Roberts, I understand your aversion uh, to the bailout, but given the existing relationship between the government and the seven largest bailout firms, how would you address executive compensation issues until such time as the government has been repaid uh, and, and been able to get out of these, the companies? Well, Special Master Feinberg, I thought, did a masterful job defending what he's doing in those seven firms. And he is, as he said, helped by consultants, uh, Lucian Bebchuk and Kevin Murphy, two economists I have a lot of respect for. But unfortunately, there is no way that they can successfully figure out the consequences of their decisions, the mix of short-term and long-term pay. Special Master talked about like it's a science. It's not a science. It's really a wild guess. And I think the real danger of his enterprise, besides the violation of the rule of law, the arbitrariness, the non-transparency, the lack of accountability, the biggest problem is that it distracts the American people. It makes them feel good. Oh, we're, we're taking care of these these seven firms, but what it does is it distracts people from the real cause of the crisis and the real reason they were so overcompensated, which is those government bailouts. So I think we ought to be focusing on the incentives that those bailouts created for egregious executive pay and, and outrageous uh, pay, and I think if we do that, we have a chance of preventing it from happening again in the future. If we stick with this system of trying to knock it down ex post in an ad hoc way, I'm worried we're going to miss the real lesson. You don't think that through this process that the folks on Wall Street will get the message? No, I don't think they will, actually. I don't think they'll get the message at all. I think we've got seven firms uh, being told uh, that they've got to behave. The rest of the firms are getting away with it. Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, as some of the other members mentioned, they're making record profits. The reason they're making those record profits is with my money as a taxpayer because of the incentives we created for them, their expectation that they would get bailed out, that expectation came true and they acted profligately and irresponsibly. And I think the whole system needs to be fixed. The only way to fix it is not from the top down with these ad hoc uh, arbitrary decisions, but rather by taking away the very system that allowed them to thrive, which is the government rescue. That's what's created the expectation of that created the current problem, and it will create the next problem if we don't fix it. Right. What else do you think we need to do? Well, politically, since mm -hmm. there's a lot of anger on Main Street, I'd go after some folks that you have direct legislative control over. So I think it's a good time to get rid of some corporate welfare. It's a good time to get rid of uh, uh, payments to millionaire agribusiness folks. It's a good time to get rid of the sugar quota, which makes every American pay more for food, it takes jobs out of uh, America into Canada where they don't have such sugar quotas. So politically, I think it's a great time to do some things that are often hard for to do, and I'd love to see Congress do that. In terms of the financial crisis, I think we're going to have to have a recognition of government's role in the housing market is going to, I hope, will change. I hope we've learned something about the challenges and dangers of trying to create a home ownership for every American. That's not the American dream. It's the dream of the National Association of Home Builders and the National Association of Realtors. And uh, that's a bit of a mistake. Fannie and Freddie are going to cost us at least $100 billion. Uh, we've, you've budgeted $400 billion. I'm worried it's going to be more than that. The Federal Reserve holds 
a trillion or so dollars of their loans, many of which will turn out to be bad loans. So I'm worried about where that's going. So I would like to see, uh, if possible, Congress put some pressure on the Fed to get out of that business, get out of the mortgage business, which it's in now, have the federal government get out of the mortgage business. But most importantly, we've got to get out of the banking business. I don't want a, a banking system that's run implicitly or explicitly by Washington. It's not going to work. And it's just going to create the next set of problems like the ones we're in the middle of now. But we have to get our money back. Well, I'm worried about that, too, because, you know, I understand that urge. And a lot of people, politically, it's very important to get your money back. But I hate to say this, it might be a mistake to get the money back. Because it could be that by propping up these organizations in desperation to keep them going, we're going to cause other distortions, other problems, other waste that we don't see because we want our money back. You know, the special master's worried about losing key personnel. Well, maybe he ought to lose them. Maybe they ought to go do something else. Maybe these organizations ought to go out of business and let some other organization thrive. We're still funneling capital and scarce resources into them. We talked earlier about GMAC. GMAC wants another bailout. Maybe we ought to say, hey, enough. It's a mistake. We're not going to get our money back. I'm not going to keep throwing good money after bad, because that's the risk that we're playing right now is we're going to continue to throw money at these folks. It's what we're doing with Freddie and Fannie. It's what we're doing with AIG. Maybe we've got to cut our losses and get out. So I understand the political pressure on you to get our money back, but maybe that's a bad risk. And to be honest, the special master has no incentive to care about that, whether that's a good decision or not. He's tasked with trying to get the money back. Again, I understand the advantages of that politically, but economically and for the citizens as a whole, that may be a mistake. My time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Well, Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll start with Professor Roberts. Uh, ironically, the 1992 Act uh, felt that executives were not linked to enough risk. In other words, their pay was not at risk in those days, and it was going up. And so people's compensation was less linked to performance. And the law, specifically, particularly taxing, double taxing, was designed to minimize the growth in the base pay and maximize the growth in risk win. Can you comment on, on, on in fact, what we should do differently if we want to see a change in that? Well, <clears throat> earlier I quoted uh, Friedrich Hayek, the Nobel uh, laureate economics uh, economist, who talked about the purpose of economics to be to tell people that what they imagine they can design, they can't really design. And there's an inevitable tendency on the part of Congress, and everybody wants to do this, try to create the perfect system as if it's uh, like the engine of a car. Let, you know, we're going to tweak the carburetor over here. We're going to add some more uh, oxygen and gasoline and this a mix of this. And uh, it's a bit of a fantasy to think that, again, the wisest people in the world could tinker and fine tune the mix of current and future compensation to get the right level of risk taking, especially if in the background you have the feeling and the expectation, and it turns out to be true, that if you mess up, someone's going to rescue you and bail you out. In particular, the bailing out of lenders to those folks is what's really dangerous, and that's what we've done yeah. over and over again. Well, thank you for answering my question and describing the Fed. Uh, he, uh, Professor Black, well, come on, that's what they do, is they sit there saying, we can tinker with the economy and there will be no recession, there will be no inflation, everything will be perfect uh, until it isn't. Professor Black, uh, you talked about Franklin Raines. Now, we have a special regard for Franklin Raines here at the dais. <laughs> Uh, what part of the, the catastrophe that the world felt do you put on Freddie and Fannie taking on knowingly, willingly, and in fact demanding to take on trillions of dollars of loans which had no underlying net value? Uh, in other words, they had no equity, no skin in the game by the, uh, the individuals, and thus no skin in the game for the banks once they got them onto Freddie and Fannie or countrywide, uh, you know, because we're talking executive compensation, you're complaining about it, but in a sense, wasn't a great deal of this growth in financial communities uh, profit at the expense of the taxpayers from day one because we were taking these risky investments deliberately onto the federal payroll or federal uh, uh, balance book? Uh, no. Uh it's actually a more complicated story. Well, well again, I appreciate the more complicated, 
But no deserves an explanation. That, that's no, right. Freddie and Fannie, did, the GSEs did not take subprime onto their books? Fannie and Freddie took less of it onto their books than did private, purely private entities. Well, All let's, of let's, them let's, but let's go through that. Freddie and Fannie took trillions onto the books, right? No. 1.9 trillion? Of subprime? Of subprime? No. What figure do you have? For subprime, they have very little, actually, uh, relatively speaking, they have relatively little subprime. They have much more of Alt-A. Alt-A makes subprime, you know, you're talking about liars loans? I, okay. You may be under the impression I'm here to defend Fannie and Freddie. Okay, but, but I let, assure you. But let's go through it. I am very different position but, but, but than let's, that. But let's go through it. If you take AIG's FP division, providing AAA rating for products that were subprime. You take Freddie and Fannie taking on subprime and Alte, and you're right about one thing, Alte as the other name for that basket of, of loans which did not have ordinary income ratios and, uh, and equity. The fact is the banks that took that and flipped it did very well, and their, uh, their executives deserved all that great pay because they managed to make money with no risk if they got it off their books. Isn't that right? In general, no. In general, these things were sold with recourse uh, putbacks. And one of the interesting- Until you bought a credit default, and then you, 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 you wrapper insured uh, the failure. Perhaps you did. We don't know about the credit default uh, swap market, you have to understand. That okay. market is still almost completely opaque. Okay. Professor Roberts, perhaps you've got more transparency in this particular area if you don't mind answering the same question. The question is what, uh, what about Fannie and Freddie's involvement? Uh, as you point out, I think one of the And Franklin Raines, who was compensated incredibly well for- $90 million dollars over a six-year period. I uh, had to give some of that back with an accounting fraud problem in 2004, but he did very well, and um, that's, that's the facts. Um, as you point out, subprime is- an elusive, sub, uh, elusive definition. The way it should be defined is troubled loans, right? Which could be for many reasons. Uh, the most interesting, I think, statistic that I know of of Fannie and Freddie is that in 2007, at the height of the, the beginning of the collapse, when almost everybody started to realize this was going to have trouble, 23% of Fannie and Freddie's home purchase loans that they purchased, that is loans they purchased that were used to buy a house, 23% had less than 5% down. Again, they were still 23%, one in every five loans, four loans they were buying had very little skin in the game. Those loans, I think, right now are on the books of the Fed. I don't think they're going to turn out very well when they reset. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I, you very I much. would only note that uh, uh, Chairman Kucinich had actually, was actually holding a hearing during that time in which those loans were still being put on, showing the the destruction that was happening in Cleveland at the time and, and the foreclosure rate that was climbing. Go right. back. Thank you very much. And I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for participating today. Uh, to uh, Professor Black, um, you have stated that government regulation and prosecution are the only solutions that can prevent an issue like this from occurring again. Uh, we now see corporations going, going so far as to sell derivatives on life insurance policies, uh, greatly increasing their risk. Uh, one can easily see the slippery slope at work here. Corporations will risk more, assuming that taxpayer dollars will be used to save them once again. Um, you have referred to the need for effective regulators. In your view, what jurisdictional power would these regulators have? Well, we should be regulating the financial lenders of America, not regulating the loan brokers, mortgage bankers, was a di disastrous uh, policy. Uh, my counterpart talked about how you can screw up regulation. That's quite true. That's why we don't do it that way, right? Let me tell you what we did and why it was so effective in dealing with subprime crisis, the non-subprime crisis of 2001, 2002. Uh, I'm sorry, of 1991, 1992. 
we didn't try to adopt perfect rules. We looked in the industry for their best practices. And we didn't go all the way to the best practice. We said, what's the prudent lenders do? And we had rules that said, you have to act in accordance with prudent members of the industry. That worked phenomenally well. It stopped what would have been a subprime crisis in those years. But we deregulated and desupervised after that point and thought it was illegitimate, impossible to regulate. It isn't. But you don't do it by creating every dot and jot. Like, you know, that's uh, not the way good regulators do it. Professor Roberts, anything to add to that? Yeah, um, there's always the hope that this time will be different. Um, when we find ourselves back in the same place, you do start to think that maybe there's some fundamental mistake that we're making. I think there's a strong desire to see an improved regulatory system. We're going to get a different regulatory system, but the, question, the fundamental question is, is it going to be improved? Uh, the challenge is, is that Fannie and Freddie, to take an example, had their own regulator. Ofeo was had, explicitly had, they weren't distracted by anything. Why did Ofeo stand by and watch Fannie and Freddie make worse loans than they did before, increasingly risky loans, loans without documentation, zero down payment loans, loans with, for 103 percent of the value of the house? Why did they sit and do that and also stand by and catch an accounting fraud way too late after it had already been spiraling out of control? And the answer is politics, right? The people involved in the regulation got leaned on, partly by Congress, partly by Fannie and Freddie, uh, as is well known, that we're caught in a vice, right? Congress wants Fannie and Freddie to be more active in, in getting loans to people who can't otherwise get a loan. It's a wonderful idea. Can't disagree with it. Everybody likes it. Fannie and Freddie want to make a lot of money, so they're all of a sudden pushing to take riskier loans. Everybody's happy until the taxpayer foots the bill. Now, the fundamental question is, why is the next regulatory system going to be insulated from that kind of political pressure? And the answer is, it won't be. And I would suggest we look for a different mechanism. And I would say again, that as long as lenders and as long as financial institutions think that they will be bailed out of their mistakes, this problem will happen over and over and over again. Now and you, you left out Treasury and Federal Reserve. In which part? Uh, as far as OFEO. Oh, well, they're also involved, right? Mm -hmm. They were also involved in, in regulation, but I would even go further. We could go to, to Basel II, and Basel II's role in trying to regulate investment banks. Investment banks, think about how great this was. Basel II said, we got to have stiffer capital requirements to make sure that these investment banks are sufficiently capitalized so that they will not go broke. And we're going to make sure they're AAA, and we're going to give them more leverage if they're backed by housing, because we know housing can't go down. That was a little bit of an error that helped not just create, but is a huge factor in this, because it allowed banks to create, it gave banks an incentive to create something that looked like AAA, which was not the toxic assets we're talking about. Going back to uh, uh, compensation, um, these regulations that you speak of, should they apply to compensation for all corporate employees or just executives? And I'd like to hear from both uh, Professor Black and Professor Roberts. Well, you don't want to make the cutoff executive because they can define that in any way and, and get around uh, anything. Uh, I put a quotation in here, since we're talking about Fannie Mae. I was an expert witness for the government against Frank Raines, you do understand, uh, on these issues, uh, in which the complete internal audit system at Fannie Mae was destroyed by the compensation system. So. If you leave it to private structures, we know empirically what they will do and that they have done for 35 years. They will systematically misalign the incentives to produce precisely this disaster, which again did not arise because of government bailouts. There were no government bailouts of Enron, WorldCom. There was no government bailout of Drexel Burnham Lambert, which was the big investment banking firm before this, right? So under the theory we've heard, private market discipline should have been very effective because there were no bailouts. It was completely ineffective. It was completely ineffective this time again. 
right? If Thank you me. rely on private market discipline, you will be back here, and the only question is whether it's three years or five years from now, with a bigger disaster on your hands. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from Ohio, Marcy Capture. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Roberts, I'm here, Dr. Roberts, I'm hearing you say that regulation was the problem. Am I simplifying too much uh, not, your statement? Not so much regulation, but the anticipation of a bailout. And although yes. All right, anticipation of thank you. And if we go back to the 1980s when the SNLs were bailed out, that was a big green light. Yep. And they went and did more yep. and much worse and now bailed out again. Um, <clears throat> the question I have, you heard the testimony this morning, uh, and Dr. Black, you did as well. I want each of you to react <clears throat> to the special master's uh, uh, statements about two and four year bonuses re or stock uh, opportunities and whether you think that time period will really work to exert any restraint inside the system. But my big question to you really is, looking at the mess we have now, what do we do as a country to put the wheels back on this financial system? There's all kinds of proposals up here for um, uh, consumer credit agencies and um, uh, new powers for treasury, uh, systemic risk councils and all of the rest. Cut through all of that. What do we need to do to restore a banking system to prudence in this country and to get our hands on the bank holding companies and all these other contortionists that turn themselves into something every time they get in trouble. What do we do? Well, I'd What first, would you advise the President? What do you advise well, us? I'd put what away the checkbook. That would be the first thing I'd advise, because I believe, uh, contrary to Professor Black, although we agree on a lot, I agree that the availability of that government checkbook is a huge driver of the irresponsibility that we've seen. I totally agree with you about the two to four year thing. I think that's a, a total, that's window dressing that gives the illusion that it's long term. First of all, four years is not long term. Second of all, three years into it, four years is not long term, right? And it's, they're going to have an incentive, unfortunately, and uh, it's happened in the past, to have the stock price go up and down a lot because when it goes down a lot, then you get your options at a low price. When it goes up a lot, you exercise them. Okay, so it takes a year and, a year and you get a, only get a third of them, or two years, you only get a third of them. It's still a bad incentive under the current system. Uh, one of the common things you hear is we need to recreate securitization, get back, get to the old model. People are scared of securitization. They should be. I'm scared of it. Look what it did to us. All right. And people say, we've got to recreate Fannie and Freddie. You know what the benefit of Fannie and Freddie was for the mortgage take person who took out a mortgage? A quarter of a percent. That's dwarfed by the hundreds of billions of dollars that we as taxpayers are going to be on the hook for. So I want more transparency. Let's not try to recreate what we've got but make it safer, which is a, 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 a mirage and an illusion. Let's be cautious. We should be cautious. We had a very bad experience. So my first lesson is don't try to recreate what we had before but safer. That's an illusion. <clears throat> Secondly, don't think you can arbitrarily steer this and that like the two to four year thing and think, oh, we solved the problem because we have the right incentives. Take away the checkbook so that people have to bear their losses. And my view is if we're back here in five years with the kind of crisis that Professor Black is worried about, I'll say, good riddance. You drove your company into the ground? Too bad. We're not going to bail you out. You lost your money. You took your chances. It's over. And people learn a lesson from it and will improve. The current system, there's no incentive for learning or improvement. It's a disaster. Dr. Black, thank you. Well, I certainly agree that the bailout is a disaster. Um, and I think, you know, probably 98% of Americans believe that the bailout is a disaster. Uh, you're always going to hear from anybody who teaches economics and teaches criminology, you've got to change the incentive structure. The incentive structure is broken. It will produce recurrent intensifying crises. It produces perfect crimes under this system. If you allow that to continue, the idea that we're going to have a cleansing every five years of a global crisis is not appealing to me, right? We can do better. We have done better. Now, if you appoint people to run agencies who do not believe in regulating, 
of course you'll have a disaster. There is an article by the FHA HUD person, very conservative, Hudson Institute, about Fannie and Freddie, who is in charge of monitoring the regulation of Fannie and Freddie. What does he say? It had nothing to do with incentives for housing. It is entirely driven by compensation and profit, right? Very conservative gentleman in a position to know. The person running OFAO, I've met with the director as part of all this. This is a conservative partisan Republican who hates regulation, right? OFAO had perfectly adequate regulatory powers to stop Frank Raines and his successor, Mudd, who was every bit as bad, from doing what they did, which is going to cost America 200 plus billion dollars. And they did nothing because they didn't believe it was legitimate to regulate. I've met with these people, right? It's, oh, I mean, we can't regulate a place, right? How could we affect compensation? That's their decisions. Now, maybe if the losses have actually occurred, then maybe we could act. Well, in the savings and loan crisis, because we recognized accounting fraud, we targeted Lincoln Savings while it was reporting it was the most profitable savings and loan in America. Can you imagine how different that is than the modern world? You talk about putting up with pressure. Charles Keating wrote, get black, kill him dead. He hired pr private detectives twice to investigate me. He sued me for $400 million in my individual capacity in a Bivens action. He got a majority of this house to co-sponsor a resolution calling on us not to go forward with re-regulation. He got the Speaker of the House, James Wright Jr., to go after us. One of these proposed charges of the Ethics uh, Independent Council was the effort of James Wright to fire William K. Black. Right? And we got five senators that I blew the whistle on, the Keating Five. And we took it. And we re-regulated the industry and we stopped control frauds that were growing at an average of 50 percent a year and would have produced a crisis of this magnitude if it had been allowed to go on. Yes, you're right. The leadership is vital and we have to have a system in which we have real civil service, where we have a real justice department, your effort to get at least a thousand additional FBI agents assigned to deal with these frauds is absolutely critical. The Justice Department in terms of prosecutors needs help as well. We have to change the incentive structures. One way is through deterrence. It's Becker and the whole theory of uh, conservatives about how you deal with crime. But another way is to get rid of the perverse incentives that now produce the perfect crimes. Uh, ladies. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just following up on what you just said, Mr. Black, uh, the President of the United States calls you in tomorrow and says, uh, asks the question that I think Ms. Capter asked Professor Roberts, what do I do to fix this mess? Um, and no matter what I have to do, I'm going to do it, even if it's just one term, because I don't want to see my country go through this again. What would you do, Mr. Black? Professor One, Black. change your senior leaders of your effort because they don't believe in regulation. And who, you mean, you mean like the head of the... I mean Summers and I mean Geithner. Okay, all right. Two, we have a series of actings running most of our federal agencies and to the extent we don't, for example, Sheila Baer at FDIC trying to do things, we have Treasury fighting a war against Sheila Baer. Mm -hmm. Stop that. Put the Brooksley Bournes, the Sheila Bears, the Mike Patriarchas, a name you probably haven't heard of, in charge of these agencies. Increase the FBI immediately. Increase the Justice Department. Direct that the priority in these cases be against the large specialty entities. The FBI is, currently has one-fifth as many agents working this crisis 
as it had working the savings and loan crisis. And this crisis, the only question is how many orders of magnitude worse than the savings and loan crisis. It is a farce. They're being overrun. It is two and a half years since the secondary market collapsed. And there has not been a single indictment, much less conviction, of anyone for the loan related. There's a you know, specialized action on Bear Stearns on insider trading mostly, false disclosures. So we need to do those things. We need to fix executive compensation and not just executive compensation. It is what is destroying our system of appraisals. Is there anybody in America that doubts that they can get a highly inflated appraisal? Well, let me ask you this. Let me, I just, I'm going to stick right where you are. If we have a situation where, you know, when I look at this, uh, this the Wall Street crowd, I believe that there are certain things that may be illegal, but I believe that there are other things that are not illegal, but to me are unethical and wrong. And I don't, I'm not sure where the line is drawn there, but it seems to me that, let me give you an example. Um, the New York Times reported last Friday that many former Freddie Mac employees had signed non-disclosure or secrecy agreements as part of their severance package. However, now both Freddie Mac and his government conservator, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, are invoking those secrecy agreements in class action securities litigation lawsuits against the mortgage giant. Do you think such secrecy agreements are reasonable? Uh, corporate tactics, and while criminal investigations can penetrate these agreements, civil securities litigation can be thwarted by the silence of key departed decision makers. And so this certainly seems to, to run counter to your testimony on defeating fraud control. I'm just curious. I agree. I think that it is terrible public policy that those things should be void as against public policy. I'll give you an example. After I gave one of my talks on control fraud, a gentleman came up to me and said, I was the guy that hired the elite MBAs for Exxon. And it's true that we lost a number of folks originally to Enron in those years. But you know what? I kept getting phone calls a year later, two years later, saying, is that job still open? This is not a place I want to be at. This kind of executive compensation, when it rewards fraud, Think of what it creates as a culture. We assume tone at the top, right? Whenever we talk business ethics, it's incessantly tone at the top. When the tone at the top is a fraud, they create a culture of fraud. The folks at, X, at Enron were not the smartest guys in the room. They were the least moral guys left at the place after the best people had left. What? By the way, the average CFO in America lasts three years. Now you can talk all you want about long-term perspective, but until we change that, it ain't going to happen. And that's one of the reasons why you're going to have very high turnover at any of these places. And you shouldn't assume that it's necessarily because Let me ask you this. Act. The money, when we see all these, say, Goldman Sachs uh, giving all of this money and bonuses and whatever, where could that, let's say it, the money didn't go there, would it then go to shareholders? And should shareholders be playing a bigger role? You follow what I'm saying? If you've got billions of dollars going out the door in bonuses, it seems to me that um, that money should be going somewhere, and the logical place for it to go would be shareholders. Well, it's worse than that, right? We first have gimmicked the accounting rules at the behest of the industry. And this is something, frankly, where Congress has culpability, in my view put pressure on FASB so that banks no longer have to recognize their losses. Second, there's a quotation in my testimony from Standard & Poor's about how they never, ever looked at the quality of the loans. Put those two things together. We are paying bonuses based on purported profits that are accounting gimmick numbers. Why? Why would we allow bonuses until they 
clean up the accounting and find the actual loan quality by reviewing the un a sample of the underlying loan files, which nobody is doing and which that farcical stress test never even looked at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, let, let me um, uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, you know, Professor Black, you stated in your written testimony that Americans are not nearly as angry as they should be, uh, of course, uh, about executive compensation. If they knew more, they would be angrier. Could you look into the camera and in one or two sentences summarize what more they need to know or what more they need to do? <laughs> they need to know that it isn't merely a populism issue, that it is the key driver along with non-regulation that produce recurrent intensifying crises and will do so again in the near term unless we fix it. They are producing perfect crimes and people will act on incentives. They will commit these perfect crimes. And the way you commit this perfect crime is to make huge amounts of bad loans with extreme leverage. What does that produce? It produces a bubble and it produces a crisis. And it does so whether you bail them out or not. You shouldn't bail them out. We agree on that. We agree that it makes the incentives worse. We agree on that. But it's not a necessary condition. All right. Here we are. Let's reverse positions for a moment. You know, you, you're now a member of Congress. When they come to us and, and they say that this particular company or it's too big to fail. What do we do then? When they come and they tell you that, it's too big to fail. That's nonsense. Uh, and the idea that you could keep them alive if it were true is worse than nonsense, right? Because they've just defined these. In their lexicon, they want a good word, right? So they call them uh, systemically important, gold star, right? Sounds good. They are systemically dangerous institutions. By definition, if a single one of them fails under Treasury's logic, it causes a global economic crisis. Why would we allow such entities to exist and then unhinge further any discipline and maximize moral hazard why? It's like we were trying to produce a bigger and badder disaster, right? So we have closed very large institutions in the past. We do it through receiverships. And we do a pass-through receivership, and the place opens. It closes on a Friday, and it opens on a Monday, and the ATMs work most of the weekend, right? So it, this is something that can be done What's lacking is the will. Yeah. Professor Roberts, you want to add something to that? Yeah. Uh, uh, tell a story. Uh, I was interviewing uh, Alan Meltzer for my weekly podcast, Econ Talk, and he mentioned that the power of FIDESHA, the FDIC Improvement Act, and he told me how it could have been used to help this transition to let some people go out of business. Some would have, some wouldn't have. And I said, well, why didn't anyone suggest that to the Treasury? And he said, I told Secretary Paulson that we should use FIDESHA. And he said, well, I asked the bankers and they were against it. <laughs> I guess they would be. So it really is a question of will. And the challenge is, as you say, too big to fail. Well, well, guess who thinks they're too big to fail? The people whose money they want to get back. And it's up to politicians and policymakers. It's up to Bernanke and Paulson and Geithner to say no. And Bear Stearns is a perfect example. Bear Stearns in March of 2008 was insolvent. There was a worry that it was going to have systemic risk. It's an interesting question whether it would or it wouldn't. I don't know. But when we decided to bail them out, Lehman Brothers, which had a very similar balance sheet, decided to double down. They borrowed more money because I think they thought they were going to be bailed out. And one of their largest lenders was a money market fund, which is supposed to be extremely conservative. Reserve Primary, that actually was the very first money market fund, was lending money to Lehman Brothers to finance their mortgage-backed securities. Why would they do that? I suggest it's because they thought probably they would get bailed out. 
Now, they weren't, as it turned out, the only one. And we've drawn the lesson that that was our mistake, that we didn't bail them out. I think our big mistake was bailing out Bear Stearns. And by the way, even when we bailed out, didn't bail out Lehman Brothers, the stock market didn't tank for a, for a week. Everyone said, oh, that was the crisis. That's when it started. It actually may have been when Secretary Paulson came up here and said, if you don't give me a blank check for $700 billion, the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. We're going to have an apocalypse. The whole economy of the world is going to go to, to, you know, going to be dissolved. That kind of scare talk, I think, had its big effect. John Taylor has written about this from Stanford in affecting how people behaved. So I think we've made some just terrible mistakes in not having the will to say no. Can I just add a second? It's not even a matter of deciding to use FIDICIA. The prompt corrective action law was passed after the savings and loan crisis in the belief that excessive regulatory forbearance had helped cause the crisis. The act in general is mandatory, yeah. particularly for deeply insolvent places. But it has a terrible weakness we told people about back when they were considering it. It can be gamed by accounting. And it is gamed by accounting, and that's why these places aren't closed. But you actually tried to mandate it. Right. I now yield five minutes to the um, gentleman from uh, California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is sort of anecdotal question, but do either one of you believe for a moment that the executives who took their deferred compensation that had become due, in other words, their accrued contracts before Mr. Feinberg took over, and they rolled them into future stock appreciation plans, meaning they rolled that many dollars into a plan that would mature in three to five years that would be, would essentially execute at the, the price of the stock. Do either of you believe that, for example, at B of A, that that wasn't simply people looking and saying, am I better off taking my money here or better off taking it here, realizing that the top 25 at Bank of America, I assume, are the most knowledgeable, best negotiators and, and smartest bankers on the planet, uh, notwithstanding the, the crisis. Well, remember, all bankers on the planet don't look as smart as they used to. But either, either of you doubt for a moment that when we went to negotiate that part, we were basically negotiating a, if it's better for you, you'll roll it over. If it isn't, you'll do something else uh, situation, the idea that we would uh, negotiate out existing contracts? Well, I was. Um, it's sort it was, of a comment I, on the quality of those people that we I, that well, I was, deal. I was deeply inspired by the special master's comments about his respect for the Constitution. They were then followed by a remark that he said, well, then, if they didn't voluntarily agree, we <laughs> wouldn't uh, we'd make them. Uh, so I think it's a very bad situation when the power of a single individual with no appeal and, again, very little transparency. We're, we're relying on the Wall Street Journal, unfortunately, to find out what's really going on. We'll find out in more detail how accurate that is, I assume. He disputes it, naturally. But I think it's a very, it's a very bad situation. I'm very sympathetic to Chairman Towns' point that, well, what alternatives do these folks have? Now, the standard view is, well, they're, they're, the, they're the best people in the business. They've got lots of alternatives. Uh, the alternatives are a lot smaller. They're a lot fewer than they used to be, right? So I think a lot of these folks were maybe doing the best they could. They certainly did the best they could for themselves. But you know, there's political pressure on, on the special master from them, lobbying him to do what's good for them. I agree. Uh, I wanted to just uh, continue the line you were already on, Professor Black, and that was uh, that our, our bailout was inherently the wrong statement. You know, in other words, we put in new money. We put it in as uh, uh, basically subordinated money. I mean, we're, we're a preferred stock, and preferred stock comes after all debt. Do either of you doubt for a moment, as a practical matter, that the world would have been different had we come in and told the creditors and stockholders of these entities that we would come in only if we came in as senior uh, debt. In other words, we'll come in, we'll provide X amount, but you'll subordinate your existing debt in order for us to keep your companies alive. Wouldn't that have changed the dynamic dramatically of where we would be, which would be in the first position, what their interest would be to get us out so that their other uh, lenders and stockholders would have a value again? I realize there's some regulatory questions at FDIC about how you legitimize that as equity, not debt. But we had the power to call it whatever we wanted. We called it equity so that we could say that their capital position was improved. But Bill Isaac and other people who gave us lots of alternatives felt that we took every, we ignored every one except the one we took. And the one we took was the one that 
froze the markets when Secretary Paulson came in and said, you got to do it now, it's a crisis, we can't go the weekend. Would either of you comment on, on that alternative from a purely incentive basis to cause their, their interests to be aligned with ours? Okay. So I have said not very nice things about Geithner and Summers. Let me add Paulson uh, to the <laughs> list as well. Uh, they're Man, all going to have to write their own books. I would not want him negotiating on my behalf if I was the United States of America. And I don't believe that's how he acted when he was at Goldman. I think he was a very unfaithful agent to the interests of the American people. But, and, and Professor Black, I'm going to follow up on that. Uh, what I talked about earlier, the fact that Secretary Geithner's operation, maybe not him, but his operation at the New York Fed took a, an opportunity to negotiate credit defaults at some amount, probably 60 cents on the dollar, maybe less, they were certainly worth less at that point, and put 100 cents on the dollar on. Do you believe that the New York Fed acted in the best interest of the American people when they paid out 100 cents on the dollar with our tax dollars? Oh, I think they acted completely contrary to the interests of the American people. And more than that, why were we bailing out AIG anyway? AIG or, the, was or, never, at least the, or at least the British division. AIG was never federally insured. If uh, I'm a signatory with a number of folks, including some very conservative folks, about what we proposed had be, should have been done at AIG, which is a separate bankruptcy for the trading arm. Um, and it's these two things you've put together for a reason. In both cases, even if we were going to do a bailout, which we shouldn't have, we did it in a way that was incredibly harmful to the American people and so obviously harmful that an experienced Goldman Sachs executive would never do that accidentally. Or several of them. Professor Roberts. Yeah, uh, I think the key point is, is that the idea that you would only pay 50 cents on the dollar or 60 cents on the dollar or 80 cents on the dollar, any of those would have been better than, than the complete bailout of creditors because creditors are the people who restrain risk taking. They only care about one thing, a creditor, downside. They want to make sure the organization stays solvent. Stockholders get the upside benefit. So by taking the skin out of the game for creditors, which is what we've consistently done with these bailouts and the bailouts starting in 1984 of Continental Illinois, basically says to creditors, lend money, you'll get it back in the worst case scenario. That's a disaster. So that story that you're talking about, which was reported by Bloomberg, that Tim Geithner, when he was head of the New York Fed, interrupted a negotiation where they were only going to pay 60 cents on the dollar and say, we'll pay the whole thing. It's terrifying. If a Martian came down and said, what is the U.S. financial system designed to do? I'm afraid they would say, it's designed to funnel money to Goldman Sachs. Now, that may not be true, but the fact that it looks to be true is not a healthy thing for no, a democracy. And in Thank the you. most I'm opaque way possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on, on that note, Mr. Chairman, uh, we continue uh, on a bipartisan basis to want to audit the Fed. So uh, that perhaps could be one of the things we gleaned from it. Mr. Chairman, uh, in closing, I just wanted to, sure. to say that I think today's hearing has created an opportunity for us to revisit how we would effectively look at Freddie and Fannie and our friend Franklin Raines, their participation in the uh, uh, the disaster that befell America. And I would ask that, uh, that we do some background discovery in preparation for a hearing where we could work together to, to find a common way to figure out what their role was and how to prevent it since, in fact, the GSEs are here for at least for the time being. Yeah. 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 Gentleman, yield. I yield back. Yeah. I yield. Yeah, yield. No, I mean, I understand your concerns and, of course, um, uh, these are things that we can look at as we move forward, but also remember that we're running out of time in terms of uh, for this session. But anyway, <laughs> um, anyone on this side seeking to be recognized before I recognize Mr. Burton? Yes, uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Kapter. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when I think back to last fall, uh, Mr. Paulson used a tactic of fear uh, that intimidated the Congress, in my opinion, and many people in the country. And the argument that was used was, if we don't do this uh, TARP and the bailout, the country would be worse off for it. And I keep looking back at what's happened, and I'm thinking, what could be worse in a district like mine than over 13 percent unemployment, foreclosures up by 94 percent, um, no credit being lent because the supervisory fees 
and uh, the FDIC fees being paid to, by the banks that didn't do anything wrong have gone up 20 times. Credit unions being asked to pay these exorbitant additional fees. They ground credit to a halt. I'm thinking, what could be worse than what's been done? And you're saying uh, that if we had resolved this in a different way, uh, perhaps the American people would have taken some nicks. But I'm saying to myself, didn't they do it in the worst way? And so um, my question to you is, how do you react to their argument that uh, today that, well, if we hadn't done that, it would be worse? Well, that's always the argument, right? They can always come back with that. The question is, are, one, the first question is, are they right? The second question is, did they actually make it better? Can we point to things they did to make it better? The thing I think that's often forgotten is the connection between uh, Wall Street and Main Street, right? The claim is, is that we hadn't saved these organizations, these financial giants, then there, the, the, the turmoil would have spilled over into Main Street and the average American would have paid a, f a fierce price. As you point out, they paid a fierce price anyway. We have unemployment on the rise, headed towards double digits. We don't know, contrary to all the economists who think they can see the future, I, I wanted to let you know they can't. They don't know whether it's going to get better or not. We don't know if we're on the mend. And I would suggest that the single biggest mistake that we have made, whether it was for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, whether you're cynical or whether you're uh, an idealist, the biggest mistake we've made is that we have created an incredible environment of uncertainty about the future for both policy, compensation, who's running the auto industry, what's healthcare going to be, what's the environment. We have all this great stuff that we're trying to do, but no matter whether it's good or not, whether you agree with this piece or that piece, the fundamental situation is, is that for the average American business person who's got to take risks, put their own money on the line, outside of Wall Street, there's still this thing that if you go out of business, you lose all your money. So the biggest problem right now is that for small business and any business that's not on Wall Street, they're scared, and, and rightfully doing, so. And what Dr. Roberts? They're talking about now going after this small business sector and securitizing any loans made to them. They're looking, they're mistake. trying to vacuum what's left a in the country of equity, again. It's a mistake. But my point is, is that because of the uncertainty about what's coming down the road, in a desperate attempt to give people ad hoc power to fix it, as a result, we've created an atmosphere where people don't know what the rules of the game are. They can't plan for the future. Everybody's waiting to see, well, maybe I'll get mine. Maybe I'll get a bailout. Maybe I'll get a tax increase. Everybody's sitting on the sidelines waiting. And until that gets fixed, I would suggest that Main Street will not recover. All the stimulus money in the world, all the new improved this and that, until we get people confident about the future, we're not going to make progress. You know, and Dr. Black and Dr. Uh, Roberts, one, one effort that you might put in the area of game theory. If they had put you two in charge, even though you have different points of view on some things, you've come together on other ones, it would be very interesting for me and perhaps other members. Going back to September, uh, involving others in our country, you mentioned Mr. Patriarcha, or Patriarcha, and I happen to think a lot of Mr. William Isaac, who resolved a lot of institutions back in the uh, 80s. Put some of those minds in the room and say, if you could unwind what was done and you could start from scratch, what would you have done, just in the form of game theory, to resolve these big ones? Because what, I'll tell you what's being said to us. Well, Congresswoman, you don't really understand because, you see, you never really understood credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations. And because those were involved, we couldn't uh, resolve the institutions and take them into receivership as we normally would with the FDIC. So you get all this flack back. Well, the truth is they didn't know, <laughs> right? And the truth is this was an entire marketplace built on don't ask, don't tell, where no one, and I mean no one, looked at the underlying loan files until Fitch does in November 2007 because the secondary market's tanked and they're not going to lose any business. And then they say the results were disconcerting and that there was the appearance of fraud in nearly every file. And you could see it on the face of the files. So they don't want to look because what they're going to see in that box is a bad thing, not a good thing. So let's put the burden on them. Make them make the case publicly with full disclosure exactly why they made these decisions. 
Right. And Ge what decisions they made and when they made them and who made them. A gentlewoman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Indiana, former chair of this committee, Mr. Burton. That's my picture up there. Do you think I look like that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank That's you, Mr. Chairman. High school I, picture. I apologize for being late getting back. <laughs> what was the answer to that? Your high school picture. <laughs> <laughs> You're in big trouble. <laughs> I apologize for not getting back quicker. We had two foreign affairs uh, meetings and I, I couldn't get back. Do you think that the uh, PAYSAR is constitutionally permissible? And uh, what, 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 do you th what do you believe the implications are for giving somebody this kind of authority, a czar like this? Either one of you. Um, I think it probably will pass a constitutional test, particularly with this Supreme Court. Um, I don't know that there's even going to be a challenge to it uh, on a timely basis. Um, I think that everybody agrees it's not the right way, and it's not even a theory of second best. Maybe it's somewhere, you know, like 12th best on the way to approach these things. Yeah. Um, but the best way was not to do nothing, right? What, what, in the what sense of allowing the incentives to remain perverse. If you're going to close the places, of course, that takes care of the perverse incentive. What, but what, if what you're do you, not... What do you, what, what do you think about uh, the approach that he's taken by uh, reducing compensation for these people, say a guy's making $13 million or $12 million, including his bonuses, and he says, we're going to cut your salary to $450,000 and we'll get the rest of you in stock as time goes by. What do you think that does to the... <laughs> The, the competent people that run these companies. What do you think is going to happen or what is happening? I know at AIG, I guess, uh, uh, or Bank of America, I, I think it's Bank of America, I think they've lost half of their people, their top management people. Well, uh, see, as I said, senior officers in America have incredibly short tenures without this program. CFOs average three years. So you're going to get huge turnover in these places. And turnover is particularly high on Wall Street because all of these guys have zero loyalty to an organization. You, you, so you they're always think, in play. You don't think this would uh, increase the likelihood that they would leave faster? Oh, I think it will increase the likelihood of some people. I mean, economics, we talk about things on the margin. On the margin, it's got to do that. But you... That's inevitable whenever you go to performance pay. Yeah, well, right? I, I would disagree with you. I think if I were a, a person who had that kind of a salary commitment and uh, they said they were going to come in and cut it to $450,000 a year, I would uh, <laughs> say, hey, you know, I think I'll go out on the street, take my $13 million bucks, and see if I can't get a job with the same kind of compensation. What do you think about that, Professor? Well, yeah, and I th well, some of them maybe they can't, which means you're – you're stuck with whoever you got there. But as you say, I think a lot of them left because they saw the handwriting on the wall and they knew they could do better somewhere else, and they're gone. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that it's not clear that we want to try to get that money back. Obviously, the taxpayer would rather have more money than less money, yeah. but the idea that we're going to pour money into AIG or into Bank of America or into Citigroup with the idea that we got to get our money back, maybe they ought to disappear. What, 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 what does that do, though, to the management people who may have the talent and know-how to, to help get a company out of this kind of a mess, and uh, they leave and you go to second or third tier executives. Well, and you're counting on them looking forward to getting that stock bonus down the road in two to three to four years. What's their optimism about that if they know that the best people are gone, right? It's really not a good system. Well, I just think if uh, the taxpayer who are the stockholders ought to be very concerned about having top-notch people in these executive positions to try to get some of their money back. I've got a couple more real quick questions. The Fed has indicated that, uh, that uh, they may start talking about expanding the salary uh, 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 conditions on all banks. Uh, what do you think about that and what do you think the possibility is? Well, everybody likes to have more power, except for the special master who said he doesn't want any more. He's only happy I know with, he says that. with seven. Well, that's what he said. Um, but the Fed, I'm sure, would, would grow and, and thrive looking over more people. I think, again, as I said before, I think that is the wrong way to fix the problem. The wrong way to fix the problem is to say, you're out of control. You take too much risk, so I'm going to take away some of your goodies so that you behave better in the future. It's not good for our financial system. It's not good for our capital system or, or investment. It's not good for productivity and innovation. 
as Professor Black said, a lot of people went out and took loans that they didn't investigate. Why would they do that? And the answer was because they had the incentive to do that. But what we have to keep our eye on the prize is that they were financing those lousy investments with borrowed money, money from the other players in the game. Why would people lend folks money for lousy, risky loans? And the answer is because they thought they were going to get the money back. Yeah. We solved that problem. We don't have to have this top-down micromanaging of salaries, which is, forget whether it's possible. The yeah. political implications of it are extremely destructive. I, I have two more quick questions, and I'll let, uh, let the chairman uh, adjourn the meeting if he so chooses. Uh, do you think Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae should uh, have the same kind of salary restrictions? restructuring done on, on them? Well, I think it's shocking that they don't. They, are, uh, they put us $100 billion in the red so far, and I think it's on the way to maybe 200 400 We don't really know. And I think if you do audit the Fed, I'd really like you to look at those yeah. uh, mortgages that they're holding because they're not marked to market. Yeah. Well, the thing that bothers me is that we've done this to these executives, and uh, they were responsible at least in part of this. But Fed, Freddie, Ma Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have they haven't done anything about that. And the last thing I'd like to ask, I'm sorry my time's out, is can you compare the crisis that we face now with the financial institutions to what happened in the SNL crisis back in the, I think, the late 80s? Uh, the crisis is vastly larger. It was a much easier crisis to stop. This was far more obvious. Um, and there was almost complete destruction of regulation this decade. And it started in the decade before. And I see it as a spillover of, again, the same mistaken attempts to re for a free lunch. Everybody wants a free lunch. I want a, a very high return investment, but no risk, of course. I want it, I want it safe and extremely high, high rate of interest. That desire of the American people, of every human being, for that kind of free lunch should not be indulged. Well, they, handled, they handled the SNL crisis much differently than they did this one. That is correct. But the and roots it, and it of worked it. worked out. Unfortunately, the roots of it are the same. An attempt to tell people there's no risk. You put your deposits in, don't worry about it. It's all taken care of. The government guarantees it. That government guarantee, explicit there, implicit with Fannie and Freddie, implicit with the investment banks, is the fundamental source of this problem. And it is a desire to deliver politically a free lunch. You will make your money, but no risk of loss. We ought to educate, and we ought to be treated like grown-ups. I'd like to be treated like a grown-up. I take my risk. I profit if I make a good choice, I'm prudent. If I make a bad choice, I lose my money. That's what capitalism is about, and we've lost it. We've got to get it back. Since I actually did it, I thank can you, tell Thank you very much. Um, gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Um, uh, earlier, I asked Mr. Feinberg um, where we're going from here. Um, he had expressed a hope that if he controlled the compensation for the seven companies, that others might, or it was his hope that they might follow by example. And I told him that I just don't see that happening. I just think, I just don't. Uh, I wish it, it, it would. And I'm just wondering, um, as I listen to you all talk about you know what you might do it's hard for me to see some of those things happening so what do you foresee let's be realistic let's assume the things that you talked about don't happen um, Mr. Black Geithner's not gone, ain't going anywhere I'm just telling you probably not and then the whole list of things and I'm, and I'm not saying that I'm not trying to take away from what you've said so what do you foresee? Well, first, our motto was uh, it's not necessary to hope in order to persevere. <laughs> and uh, I would say the circumstances were vastly worse than the savings and loan crisis in terms of the correlation of political forces, right? The President Reagan's Justice Department threatened to indict the chairman of our agency criminally for re-regulating the industry under the Anti-Deficiency Act, under the argument that we were closing too many insolvent institutions, right? That's the world that we lived in. So I don't give up. I know these things seem improbable. I know that the forces, you know, opposing us seem unbeatable. But 
America has not been characterized by crony capitalism, and it's up to us to keep it from going that route. And if we give up and we aim really low in terms of our reforms, that's exactly what we'll get. Because the master is frankly wrong on that point you asked about. Some well-run corporations may, in fact, listen to him. That's not where the problem is. The problem is in the majority of corporations, that's what the statistics show, that deliberately and egregiously misalign the interests through their compensation system. They will not listen to the master. They will continue and they will continue to produce further crises whether or not we bail out the institutions. Mr. Black, on, Professor. Well, I, I, on an optimistic note, whether most corporations or some corporations adopt the idea of incentivizing long-term incentives through stock holdings, most, many corporations already do that. Most corporations, of course, some are flawed, some make mistakes, but most of them don't come to Washington with their hand out. That is a problem of right now the auto industry because of their special political pull and the financial sector through an even more special political pull, their long-term relationship with Washington. That's what has to be stopped. Now, on the optimistic side, um, true, Mr. Geithner's not going anywhere, but you, you here in Congress, you want to stay in office. You're going to listen to the American people. If the American people say, oh, we had to have these rescues, we have to recreate what we had before, and make sure we stay like we did before, you're right. Nothing's going to change. But if they say, which I think they are increasingly saying, we want to stop giving money to really rich people, and the right way to fix that is not to take it away at the last minute from seven of them, but to destroy the incentives that allowed them to take it in the first place, then I think we have a chance to really fix the problem. It's not going to be easy. As Professor Black said, uh, it's, a long, it's a long road. We all, I think, have, I hope, something to contribute. Some of us a very small bit, and some of you a lot larger. But it's, it's, not, it's not a force of nature. It is a matter of will. And that will be bolstered by the American people's outrage, not just at the fact that people make a lot of money, but the way they made it, through taking risks with money that was borrowed on the presumption that it would be paid back by the taxpayer. That is corrupt. That is the crony capitalism we have to stop. And it's in your hands. The next time you, you not you, but the, the, the Congress as a whole, the next time the Congress as a whole confirms a candidate for the chair of the Fed, or the Secretary of the Treasury, I'd like you to get them to make a commitment, they may not keep it, that they will not re return money dollar for dollar to lenders who make bad risks and finance bad bets. Ask them to commit to 50 cents on the dollar. Ask them to commit to encouraging losses. Now, they may not keep that promise, but that's where it starts. People putting at least their reputation on the line. And I think there's a hope there. The, um, when, we, um, when we see people uh, being thrown out of their homes and because of foreclosure and Washington Post just had an article saying how in some instances it's doubled over the last year and then you see people losing their jobs and what have you. Um, are you surprised that there's not more of a balance here? In other words, we hear about spending, uh, say for example, $180 billion for AIG, but we've got people in our district that it would probably take at best, ten thousand dollars, and they could stay in their homes, and so that so that the American people just don't. I mean, it's hard for them to see; they don't understand it. It makes no sense, um, and I think that adds insult to injury and the loss of jobs, of course, savings, etc. That's why crony capitalism destroys democracies over time as well, corrupts them. People understand after a while that it isn't what they do, it's who they know. And one of the things that's unusual about America in polls is how few Americans have that view compared to other places. It's a really productive process not to have that view, to believe that merit mm -hmm. really is something important. But it's perfectly rational as people see more and more cases of the rich getting bailed out to say no, it is mostly a matter of who you know. It's a sick system, and people start withdrawing from that system, and nations and even societies break down when it happens. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Let me thank the gentleman from Maryland for uh, his, uh, his time has expired. Um, let me begin by thanking all the witnesses. Let me thank Mr. Feinberg, and of course, uh, let me thank you, Professor Black, and Professor Roberts. And let me thank the members on both sides of the aisle that attended the hearing. The American people are angry. They are angry that while millions of hardworking Americans are losing their homes, and life savings, bank executives are rewarding themselves for failure. The idea that hundreds of thousands of dollars in salary, plus millions of dollars in stock options, is not an, enough for the executives, bailed out by the American people, is exactly the type of thinking that got us into this financial crisis in the first place. We need to link bank executives' compensation to performance. I've never seen or heard of people that fail getting a bonus. And of course, then the answer to it is that if we do not give them a bonus after they fail, they might leave. Well, I think that you should say goodbye. That is exactly what the special master and the Obama administration has done. Without this crucial link, we will continue to have perverse incentives for bank executives to take unjustified risk with taxpayers' money. This is unwise and unacceptable and must be stopped. Again, let me thank you for being here to witnesses and thank the members for attending. This committee is now adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you.